Welcome to Sync Up, a show about OneDrive, the intelligent files app for Microsoft 365. We are your hosts, Ankita Kirti and Jason Moore. I'm Ankita Kirti, product manager on the OneDrive team. And I'm Jason Moore, group program manager for OneDrive. This show will take you behind the scenes of OneDrive, shedding light on how OneDrive connects you to all of your files in Microsoft 365, so you can share and work together from anywhere while protecting your work from accidental loss and malicious attacks. Today, we have Gaia Karini and Dio Madeleine to talk about large-scale deployments of OneDrive. Gaia Karini is a program manager on the OneDrive Sync team. Drew Madeleine is a senior manager at Protivity, responsible for helping companies move to Microsoft Cloud technologies such as Office 365 and Azure. So don't go away. We've got an exciting show today. Jason, what is the one question we get asked very often at AMAs and booths? Um, at after different, talks and uh, yeah, after at talks, all these yeah. conferences. Yeah, we get asked all the time, how does Microsoft deploy and configure OneDrive across all of its employees, and how does it make that work? Exactly. We are always about asked about the best practices and tips for a successful deployment. And to all our listeners who are IT admins, we get it. We understand how important it is for you. So today, we got the experts in the room. And on your behalf, we are going to ask them plenty of questions on how to plan and execute a successful OneDrive deployment across PC and Mac. So if you are ready to roll out OneDrive, listen on to discover the best tips and learnings to ensure a quick and painless deployment and at the same time maximize your end-user engagement. Our guests today are Gaia Karini and Drew Maidlung. Gaia, Drew, do you want to introduce yourselves a little bit? Yeah, totally. Hi, everyone. I'm Gaia. I'm a PM uh, on the OneDrive Sync team, and I've been at Microsoft for a little over seven years now. I started at Microsoft working on a system that basically allowed OneDrive, Microsoft account, Outlook.com to deploy the code that the engineers were building to the data center. And then if there wasn't any issue, repair those servers. Then I moved over into the OneDrive team and worked for several years on the consumer backend service, figuring out how do we scale the service and really modernize it. And then finally, about three years ago is when I started working on OneDrive Sync, and I absolutely fell in love with working on OneDrive Sync, and so it's been a super fun experience since then. Yeah, we've been glad to have you. Drew, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, thank you, Jason. Uh, so my name is uh, Drew Madeligan. I am a consultant over at uh, Protivity right now, and I... My background actually comes from the IT professional, so I'm excited to talk uh, kind of more about OneDrive today. Uh, I've been consulting for uh, going on seven years, primarily in the collaboration space, so sticking with uh, helping companies adopt uh, and move into Office 365 from um, small companies to companies well over 100,000 employees. Uh, and actually, I like to call it, I was one of the original Microsoft OneDrive experts team here. That's part right, of that team the as mode well. program. I was one of the core members of that one uh, when I was still there. So I've been uh, consulting with OneDrive and ha helped a lot of different companies of all different sizes uh, roll it out along with the rest of the Office 365 suite. Awesome. Well, welcome to you both to the show. We're going to have some fun today. Yeah. Nikita, do you want to kick it off with our first question? We have Drew here on popular demand from Twitter. We've got requests on Twitter to get Drew. I think Drew is the one. number one requested guest we've had so yes. far, right? So I just wanted to call it out before we begin. Yeah. So, okay, Drew, what should we keep in mind before uh, we start to plan deployment? And specifically, a question that we've asked, we've been asked so many times, uh, how do you plan or estimate for bandwidth utilization? Yeah, those, are, those are really good questions, and I've worked with a couple different companies on that as well. The first thing when I, when I start out kind of talking about planning and deploying OneDrive, I, even though it is an IT professional ask, I always want to start out with saying, it's not just about the tech, uh, that you need to plan the business side of a OneDrive deployment. Uh, too many times I see companies starting with, how do I just deploy the same client and then kind of call it a day? But you really want to understand who are your users, what is going to be going to be their impact, and how do you really build training and adoption beyond kind of getting that initial deployment done? I think, you know, you're kind of getting to, like, the whole point of why you deployed in the first place. Like, what's the value you're getting out of it, uh, right? And then and how does a company really see that value come through? Absolutely. So when we talk about deployment, again, from the IT Pro side, that's what I love to do. But I've seen failures in deployment because 
you can deploy a sync tool and you can tell people send one single email that one drives all set up but if no one's using it if you don't have a migration plan if you don't really have a, a strategy for why you want to be using this it's not going to work as well as it could be so the planning you need to make sure you take you bring the right people into the room for your planning bring your business readiness teams in bring your communication teams in show them the power of what OneDrive can be and why you need it and then it can really lead into more of the technical deployment uh, answers and questions that you want to get to once you kind of bring these teams together. Makes total sense. But bandwidth is a good one too. Right? So, and Keith said, you, would you want to touch a little bit on training comms? I know that's one an area that's very important to you as well. Yeah, actually, I was about to say that this is very similar to what we discussed on our customer success podcast, which was, I think, the fourth episode uh, in which uh, we had experts on adoption who spoke about similar aspects of when you start to plan about deployment, the first thing you should think, or in parallel, you should also think the business side of deployment as to how you're going to drive consumption and how you're going to drive adoption and how you're going to train your folks. So, yep, that's a great point that you brought up and I'll shoot it back to you. And I, I just love the, the idea of getting everyone together too, yeah. that notion of like, hey, how are these, these different parts of the company, the organization working together in order to make that happen? Yeah, I almost always start out my, my conversations with someone is that it's not just about the tech. And then we'll, I'm not going to have that first meeting with that team until we kind of bring the other p- people in. So you have that meeting. What's kind of next, right? One of, the, one of the phases in your planning for deployment is around network utilization. So there are some key areas that I, I always try to highlight uh, in your planning, one of them being network. I'll come back to that one. The yeah, that one is here. definitely super important. I hear about customers all the time running into potential issues there, and there's a bunch of tips and tricks there. Absolutely. Uh, so that one you really need to start with. Uh, now, on the networking side, what I like to use are actually some of the Microsoft tools available to you today. I'm working with a customer today uh, where we actually are using some of the uh, the operation management suite, so actually some of the logging that you can get configured onto a user's workstation. And you can actually have that all of the bytes sent and received sent back up into Azure that you can report on through Power BI. So that's one that I really like to do, uh, where you can basically have a solution installed in a partner's workstation. You pilot this out for a subset of people, and you get to see what it looks like when you roll out OneDrive to them. And you can start with your control of what is their data usage for, let's say, a week, their bytes in and out. Let's install OneDrive. Let's move the let's move their files. Let's do a, a KFM, a PC folder backup, and move them up. And then let's look at what their usage is beyond that. So you can actually see what the bandwidth utilization is going to be moving to from before and after in actual real-world scenarios. Now, you really don't want to do that for everyone, but it gives you a really good baseline by using uh, logging and then being able to report on it per machine. Have you, have you ever found anything particularly anomalous or crazy in doing that? Has, you know, what's the, what are the kind of range of things you see when you start looking at that data and really understanding it? The main one you see is the amount uh, is with KFM, it is what and the impact that KFM has as far as like signing on and initially bringing files into the cloud and syncing them in mass. And what you see is that that does actually put a good load on your network for a period of time. So you'll see giant spikes on the first day, the mm-hmm. first like two days, and then it drops drastically. You see these really, really big spikes and then a really, really big letdown. And you see a couple different spikes when people are uploading files. But the, bigger t- the biggest takeaway I see for people is with that is showing them that when you initially start this migration, you initially start this deployment is you don't need to do it all at once. Right. Yeah. Think, look at look at how you phase this out and say, we don't need to have everyone's files moved up on by tomorrow. Let's talk about how we pilot this out and phase it out so you can want you can keep your bandwidth in a more consistent consistent usage pattern. Mm-hmm. A few other examples um, that I remember working in particular with a large consumer goods company last year, but really I hear about this a lot from different customers. A few other ones that come to mind, uh, PST files or other files that frequently right. change, even if it's not that part of that initial KFM deployment, can result in ongoing upload traffic. And so that's definitely one that good to keep an eye out for. The other one is if you've migrated a bunch of content into the cloud and then you don't have, for some reason, files on demand on, um, that can result, and especially if users are syncing team sites, then that can cause huge download bandwidth. Um, And so definitely files on demand is super important there. Drew, uh, you said that you were working with a company 
uh, organization currently would you mind sharing how big this organization is how many users uh, or generally how big the organizations are that followed this process that you just spoke about or recommend great question like so the the user count i'm working with right now is around 25000 globally uh, the network testing i see uh, in process is really depends on what your global footprint is though so if a company is feels comfortable with their network bandwidth and kind of is com- it's a general question of how, what is your what is your total capacity right? what is your pipe right. do you have concerns today if you don't really have concerns and you're just in the US and you have like two locations all co-located perfectly it's not necessarily a concern i start to see challenges when things move uh more globally and especially if people are working on proxying any of that traffic or routing any of that tra- traffic through like VDIs like understanding the routes and the locations of where those the data traffic gets out will tell you really where you need to worry about it so larger companies for sure the ones that have global footprints are the ones that i see the uses for that the most um smaller ones you can kind of imp- you can do some high lo- some low level impact but as long as you just scale it out a little bit i have never seen any issues with a kind of as it moves into a smaller organization. And Drew, I imagine in that large company case where it is global, you might just break it up into sections and say, hey, this, you know, we've got a set of folks working in the field with a really low bandwidth situation. They might be part of a third or fourth phase of migration where you focus on the things that are easier to control or where you have that confidence in the, the network and capabilities. And, and I would put that with any type of OneDrive rollout here is that you still hit the low-hanging fruit. you hit the ones that you know you're going to be successful with so you can show from a communications training feedback that this is a successful product release right and there will always be whether it's naysayers that don't want to use the product whether it's challenges for a remote location in some of a farther away country than the US that we're in or that I'm headquartered in that's all dependent but as long as you kind of have your plan and what i like to say is when you're planning is don't underestimate this plan the more you understand the impact of the rollout uh the more you understand things like migration security um the rollout approach that we're we're kind of talking a lot about here it will make it a successful rollout as long as you spend more time than you think so if you spent a month planning add an extra two weeks on it and make sure you got it right the areas that you're kind of referencing Jason with is how to limit the impact of that but not slow down your rollout that's cool okay awesome so- what are the other areas that we you would want us to plan i mean you recommend cust- uh, customers planning Uh, I like to think of it as a life cycle that you have with it. So uh, the first one you're going to talk about is going to be the migration, like what are your content analysis? So is there going to be a need to move content out? Right? Am I bringing like a? I, I can almost say 95% of the companies have an F drive or a P drive or a home drive or whatever right, drive right. it is. It will be a personal drive somewhere, and that's the one that understanding what you want to do with that. There's had its own little plan. We could probably do a whole podcast just on that one, um, but understanding what you want to do. and what the business impact will be and then network is the next key one uh, and then as you're moving down to figure out your devices hopefully you you understand or we going what's the mobile experience that you want to be and that you want to get to uh, to be honest you can't really have a one drive rollout without mobile so make sure you plan for that don't underestimate it and then figure out your approach uh how are you going to pilot who's going to pilot uh, jason more back to your point how are we going to structure this from a a location breakout from right, a business right. standpoint. I see a lot of people going it by business units or business segments these days. Sure. Um, moving a marketing team, moving a sales team because you start to see the collaboration capabilities. Yeah, you want everyone to together. enjoy them together, right? And then you and you talk about the sharing and the security that you get. So you can say if I'm working in the marketing team, we can all work on files together, we migrate your files and you're going to be in a better state than you're in than let's say I mean the marketing team might not be working as much with the IT team. Right. That, that's that's okay. So figuring out what that approach looks like um will kind of give you a road map. Then you'll know who's going to move, when they're going to move, how they're going to move and mm-hmm, what they're going to mm-hmm. and that will give you your full kind of life cycle of what that management and, and that deployment plan will look at look like. That's a, that okay. So we have the basis now of a plan. That's getting all of it in. Are there other kind of like life cycle issues I need to worry about or think about? Oh, that's a, yeah, that's a good that's a good one, Jason. That's one that sometimes is is missed a little bit. So, uh One good life cycle thing to be aware of in your planning is what happens for when employees uh join, move or leave the company. Right. And this is one where a lot of times people have a process with their with their home drive or their P drive where they might move the files to some archive location or they uh sometimes I've seen ones where people just never get deleted. 
Like here's Bob's <laughs> files from seven years ago, and they're just still sitting in this network share because right. Bob's just not here. <laughs> um, but that's not good. So under in with OneDrive, you can't do that. Right? You're going to have cleanup processes that are going to occur unless you do something about it. So I have been bitten. I have seen where someone leaves the company or an, or the account has been removed inappropriately, and their personal files are removed because that a life cycle for your files will happen. So in making sure you understand uh, the impact when users do come in, like are they, what are they going to get for OneDrive? How, how do you notify them? Uh, if they do move departments or move uh, areas, regions, when we're talking about multi-geo, it's more of that impact. Right. And, and then when they leave, uh, what's going to happen with their OneDrive and what needs to happen from a compliance standpoint? Right, because depending on the organization and the regulatory environment, you're going to need to plan around that and understand the, the employee's role and what that data needs to be, how that data needs to be handled. A scenario that I've, I've talked with a customer about recently where what happens when someone goes to an expat for three years? Do right. we need to actually move their data? Is that considered moving it to the EU to handle that information? We have, if you have multi-geo there, is, it, is that considered a valid move for GDPR? It's, so there are, there are complications when you get to scale around compliance, but life cycle is a big one, uh, especially for around leave discovery and um, moving between areas. That's awesome. But let's turn a little bit on a little more focused on the sync client. Since we have got Guy here, absolute expert leading our sync team. Uh, Guy, can you tell us a little bit about the update process for sync? I think it's something that people would love to demystify. Can you maybe give us a little bit of the flavor on things like how do I choose the different ways to get updates per user versus per device installs? Um, and then, of course, my favorite, just Talk a little bit about why auto-update is just so important to the product. Yeah, totally. So let me start, actually, before update, let's talk a little bit about setup. Sure. Um, On Windows in particular, we install OneDrive with both Windows 10, on all Windows 10 machines, and then we also install it with Office. That's right. If you you don't go that route, you can obviously download our installer from our release notes page and then deploy it either manually or through SCCM or Intune. Um, and there's actually two flavors of that setup, like you mentioned. There's per user, which has been our traditional type of install, just installs for every user profile on the machine. And that's how, like, Chrome gets installed yeah, or other exactly, apps today, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. And then more recently, uh, actually late last year, we GA'd with our per machine installer, which was a big request from a lot of customers who in particular have scenarios that have a lot of different user profiles on the same machines. Even in some cases, I talked to certain customers who had maybe like a kiosk machine that had 100 profiles on the same machine. And so they ideally didn't want 100 different (laughs) versions of the sync client. All updating in the background. Yeah, exactly. And then whenever the next user logs in, we would have to auto-update because they might not have logged in for a while. And so we had a big request basically for per-machine installs. And does that also... that. That has an impact for our VDI scenarios, right? Yeah, exactly. So VDI is another key scenario where a lot of users uh, will log into the same machine with different sessions. Um, Yeah, we built support for per machine. um, And so it's not required, but it's definitely something, especially if you have this type of scenario or you want to make sure that you have a single version on a particular machine is something that you can take a look at and deploy. On Mac OS, um, we also install uh, with Office. Um, Or you can install our clients separately, um, and we have a standalone version, which is really what we recommend, in particular in enterprise deployments. It's a lot easier to manage and configure and deploy. And then we also, of course, have our App Store version. And last episode of Sync Up, we had uh, Brittany and Jonathan from the Sync team talking about our macOS Sync client and how it works and yeah, definitely. And they're, they're the experts there, and I definitely recommend checking out that episode if you're if you have Mac devices in your organization. Um, so we talked a little bit about, about setup. So there's different ways you can get sync set up. Um, there's different flavors of that setup, but then really updates. And that's a question that comes up a lot with different customers. And while we deploy OneDrive with Windows and Office, uh, we actually update OneDrive independently. And there's a lot of different reasons for that. We really think of the OneDrive sync client as an extension of the OneDrive and SharePoint service. And because it's really a thin client and it's an extension of the service, it's super important for us to auto-update to really provide that great sync experience. And we have several different rings, as a lot of you listening, I'm sure, are familiar with. We actually have five rings. Two of them are internal. We have an MSIT fast and MSIT slow ring. Wait, MSIT? That's an acronym. What's that mean? Yeah, great question. It's basically how we've referred to in the past as our Microsoft environment. Um, So we have an inner ring that has a lot of folks from kind of our um, office team and OneDrive and SharePoint, and then we have the rest of Microsoft. And so we deploy on different cadences there. 
And then once, you know, code has made it there, everything looks good, made it to MSIT slow, then we'll deploy it to insiders. That includes all of Windows insiders, Office insiders, as well as anyone who's gone and set the group policy or who's gone into the sync client and checked the box that says, I want early releases. So if you're listening right now at home and you aren't using early bits or you wanted to try out the latest sync client, you can just go right go into the sync client. Yeah, there's a new settings. setting. Yeah, there's a setting. Um, there's a little checkbox. You can do that. Awesome. Or, of course, we have the group policy. So we have insiders. We try to deploy there every week or so. Um, definitely where we enable features early. So really recommend it, especially within the IT department or some kind of fans or early adopters, we recommend having them there. Production is our default um, and is what we recommend everyone stay in uh, for folks who are not in the insider's ring. That's really where you'll see a lot of our bug fixes and features light up um, pretty quickly. We try to deploy there at least every month, if not every two weeks, but generally every month or so. And then, of course, we have our enterprise ring, um, which is really more of a ring meant for folks who want less often deployments or who might have a requirement to deploy a version manually, then you have that 60-day buffer between when we announce a new version in the enterprise ring and when we actually deploy it. Um, and that can be a good experience. But if you don't have those requirements, our recommendation is definitely to stay on production, opt in some people to insiders. Um, and a key thing to note is there's two URLs in particular that are super important for our updates to work correctly. Sometimes I get a question like, well, why are those URLs important if we're deploying a build manually through SCCM, let's say? And the key thing to note is actually that's also how we enable features and bug fixes. Basically, every change we make is generally behind a config switch that we call a ramp. And so ramps actually get delivered through those same URLs. And so it's super important, let's say if you need a new feature like the OneNote KFM support, having those URLs unblocked is the only way that you'll actually get that feature to work. So that's an important thing just for everyone to understand, I think, you know, is the notion that you get, if you're getting a sync client, whether you're in insiders or in production or enterprise, mm -hmm. you're getting the sync client, which is kind of a steady state thing. Mm -hmm. But for all the features to light up, mm -hmm. you need to be able to know which ramps are enabled. Yeah, exactly. And so wh when people watch a deployment happen, you'll see bits go out, but then you'll see f features start to turn on, yeah. even though there's no new bits, yeah, right, exactly. because of those. Exactly, and that's Super why sometimes cool. you'll see in our release notes, a lot of times we, we have a little section that says features that are getting gradually enabled. That's because it's not just about the build, but it's also about those feature ramps. That's right. And we want to make sure that each one of those independently is yeah. stable exactly. and fast and exactly. reliable. And if there's any issue, then we can just turn it off without having to actually hot fix the build, which would obviously cause more churn. Now, a question I get a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure you get this one as well, is how much bandwidth does an update take? How, yeah. much, how much impact do those things have? Yeah, so what we see is actually it's really um, not a huge impact because the installer, I think last I checked, is around 27 or so, or less than 30 megabytes. Right. And so really, if your network can handle syncing files, which generally in a lot of cases are larger than 30 megabytes, then really updates are not really an issue, especially because we have some built into the client. We have some randomization, so it's not all happening all at once. We also stagger the deployments, in particular for the prod ring. We have many different stages that we um, deploy to, and so you'll see those kind of spread out across a certain period of time. So it's really not, even though I hear, hear about the concern a lot, we haven't really seen any issues from different customers. At least cool. I haven't. Is this uh, this process is different for um, on-prem updates? It is not. We actually use the same client um, to talk to Sure for SharePoint 2019. We have the modern sync client, um, and uh, that we deploy to that. The, it's basically the same client, and so that just talks to your on-prem environment. Now, of course, if you're using Groove, it's a different story. But hopefully, most folks are in the process of moving over either to SharePoint Online or to Server 2019. The really good point I want to touch on network here as well, because we did touch on network, is having those URLs are really important. And there is a full list available uh, for Office 365, for SharePoint Online, and OneDrive for Business that includes uh, all of the different URLs and IP ranges that you need to have open to support OneDrive for Business. And that is one when you're looking at planning your deployment, especially at, at a large scale. A lot of times you'll have things potentially blocking this at a firewall level or at a proxy level. Yeah. And you need to make sure that those are available to you, not just for the update process, but really for the for the entire solution to work together. And there are some ones in there that you would not necessarily expect, but are definitely important to have open. 
Yeah, no, times. that's a great point. And in fact, we should make sure we'll put it in the show notes, some of those links, because it's just great information to have and know. I know a lot of times people are kind of looking through ways to lock down their networks, but these are important ones yeah, to, totally. to get the full value. Yeah, and all up, all, everything that Gaia just spoke about uh, and everything that we'll discuss during the course of the podcast, uh, for listeners who need to learn more, please uh, go to aka.ms slash OneDrive slash deployment. That will take you to our docs.microsoft.com page. Um, and you can learn about the updates, the rings, the different methods of deployment and all our recommendations. Yeah, handy documents that kind of go into detail on in all of this and, mm -hmm. and give you a hard copy uh, to look over at your leisure. Yeah, totally. So, yeah, auto updates, super important just to get all the latest fixes, make sure you get the latest features, and then you don't have to worry about packaging or managing all those deployments. And so, awesome. yeah. And, and Drew, did, do you have anything else to add on that? Like, I know you've got a lot of experience in the wild deploying this in client. One thing I really want to make sure to highlight at the top is is that per machine install. That's been a, a really great addition into the repertoire for us for deployment because because of those VDIs and shared workstation scenarios. But really coming from the IT Pro, we want one version. We want to know what's out there. We want to be able to, if someone asks a question to support, right, how do we know what's happening? And, and how do we effectively answer it? So every company I've been working with now has been how do we get onto per machine? How do we make sure that the install process for that is is pretty seamless. You can install that right through right through SCCM mm -hmm. or through whatever process that you would like to deploy. Uh, it's really just a slash all users commandlet uh, or command on your on your install, and it will do all of the work for you. So that's awesome uh, to thing. hear. That's actually one of the features I was working on last year. So <laughs> 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 yeah, it was uh, a good example. I actually uh, had a company that we had to move out of. We moved them out of the enterprise ring into the production ring uh, to get that available to them. Awesome. Uh, when it mm -hmm. became because that was a, is a very uh, nice to have because uh, when you it's interesting in SCCM you can run a you can run a report to see how many versions of OneDrive are installed in your in your environment and sometimes it's insane. It, it's crazy. <laughs> Because yep. every version of Windows 10 will have a different version from 1709 up to 1809 and fo going forward. I mean, it's very hard to manage and patch and control at that level. Okay, so Drew, you, you said something I want to hit on, which is kind of about SCCM and, and these installer, these management solutions. How, how do you suggest someone actually decides between SCCM or some sort of MDM solution for deployment? A great question, Jason. One of the things I want to make sure to highlight is what SCCM is. And so SCCM is a primary deployment tool uh, for Microsoft called System Center Configuration Manager. At scale, that's definitely one that we see companies use uh, to deploy and manage their workstations. Uh, you actually have a configuration database that uh, manages your content, manages your applications, mm -hmm. and you can actually deploy all of your solutions or all of your, uh, whether it's a configuration or an application, uh, directly back out to, those part, to a user's workstation. So, from a deployment standpoint, it's great to, let's say, package OneDrive and deploy it using a CCM because you can deploy it onto your managed machines. But that's, that's awesome. one thing that does not cover uh, is as you kind of think about the full solution of devices, as we mentioned, which is uh, what, what do we do for mobile? Right. And, and what do we do with newer versions of Windows 10, which for us, a device is a device, right? It's a right. cloud device. It's, it could be a, a mobile device. It's a device. And that's when we're looking at more modern device management or cloud device management, which you can use an, an MDM solution, let's say like Intune. So the primary ones I've seen as, at scale has still been SCCM. Uh, companies, as you get between 5, 10, 50,000 users, you're, they're going to have SCCM. Well, and I when mean, these I, tools I, work, right, it's, uh, it takes a while for you to adopt new ones and change. It is very hard. And so the most common scenario I'm seeing is a combination of both, which is considered co-management. And so I'm seeing companies evolve into co-management for OneDrive, uh, which you initially, let's say, deployed OneDrive uh, through CCM. And now you're deploying, uh, you're managing actually your mobile devices through Intune. So you're managing deployments of that. And now, let's say with the next version you want to roll out. So let's say I want to deploy, a perfect example is I want to deploy a per machine install. Right. How am I going to do that? Uh, you can actually switch to more of a co-management solution where you can use something more, maybe you start moving to an administrative template version in Intune to control certain standards of OneDrive uh, for that deployment um, while still managing kind of the core functionality and other systems through, um, through SCCM. 
That makes total sense. And I, I love the, I haven't heard the term before, but co-management to describe that situation, especially as folks think about all the mobile devices getting deployed in their organizations and how they have a strategy for those. Intune is amazing, right? We, when you deploy applications through Intune, it's got a lot of power and a lot of capabilities, but SCCM has been around for a very long time. So from a, a full parity perspective and for larger deployments, uh, sometimes you get into some very nuanced situations that you'll need to control, um, running different scripts on different times, um, handling different types of redirection that uh, you really need to have full config management solution available to you. And I bet you're going to tell me this is all stuff I should cover in my planning. <laughs> you need to cover most of it, right? You need to understand, at least from a tool perspective, what you want to do uh, and how you want to deploy it. And I think there are some really good discussions around uh, what is the best method for deployment. But realistically, once you kind of pick one of those tools and kind of you have an understanding of what you need to do, it does become an application. An application is an application. And how most larger companies have hundreds to thousands of applications. It's just another one on the list. Another really cool thing about Intune that we released last year, I don't know, I get the question a lot, so I wanted to briefly mention it. Um, so a lot of times we talk about, you know, that we have this really long page about all of our OneDrive group policies, and typically, you know, the main way to deploy those has been through group, pol through group policy objects or through SCCM. And there were some ways to do that through Intune by ingesting our ADMX file, but actually last year we worked with the Intune team to publish all of our group policies. So they're actually available as administrative templates for Windows 10 in the Intune portal. And so if you go to create a new device profile, you can filter to Office. And then if you search for any of our group policies, you should be able to find those. And so that's pretty cool if you're using Intune. That's super helpful, yeah. yeah. Those have been great. Those have been really good talking points and have been able to ease the conversation when you're transitioning uh, from SCCM into Intune. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. My next question is about group policies. Oh, okay. And so, <laughs> Gaia, what are the top three group policies that a customer should take advantage of to drive maximum user engagement? Great question. I'm going to actually cheat and give you four. <laughs> <laughs> um, the first one, which I think has been top of mind for a lot of folks, is known folder move. That basically allows you to move your users' desktop documents and pictures into OneDrive. And really, the reason why that really helps with you driving user engagement is because a lot of times users are used to saving files in those familiar locations because they've used Windows for so many years. And so this really makes sure that all of those files are protected in the cloud and they get all the benefits of all the awesome features in OneDrive like sharing and being able to roll back to a different version and everything else that we always showcase about OneDrive. I, I love this because it's such a great way to say the company can get value even before the end user is necessarily mm -hmm. gotten fully educated exactly. and taking, you know, taking yeah. advantage of OneDrive. Right. The company at least now is in a place where content's protected and exactly. backed up and so on and so forth. Yep. So that one is definitely one. Um, there's a bunch of guidance that we recommend, and I, I think we can talk to a little bit more about that later. But definitely known folder move is one to really look at as you think about driving engagement with OneDrive. Um, the next one, in some ways, goes hand in hand, um, it, which is silent account config. Basically, this allows you to automatically sign in users with OneDrive using their Windows or their Office credentials. Um, and so what that means is basically, you know, the user has signed into their machine or they've signed into Office, and then we will pick up those credentials and automatically sign them into OneDrive, which means the user doesn't have to, you know, click on the cloud icon and then figure out they have to log in and enter their credentials. And so it just makes it easier for them to automatically just be set up. And if you do that with known folder move, then they're automatically signed in, and also they have all their content going into OneDrive. And uh, yeah, th this one, there are some caveats. So you have to have Azure, Azure AD or hybrid Azure AD. Um, but definitely if you have that configuration is something you should take a look at to really make sure the most users you can are signed into the same client. And there's some really good documentation around that one, actually out on the, the enterprise deployment plan for, or the enterprise deployment documentation for OneDrive, all about those prerequisites that you need to have out there uh, and enabling it, ensuring you kind of have that piece of set when you enable those GPO policies. Yeah, perfect. So we'll make sure to include those, I think, in the show notes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, the next two are two that are actually enabled by default, but I like to talk about them as part of what we call the sync ideal state, really the ideal deployment configuration, because, um, you know, some companies might have disabled them or, you know, a user might have disabled the feature. And so it's really important to understand why they're so important. The first one is the office integration policy. 
And again, it's enabled by default, but I really want to call it out because it's key in order to be able to take advantage of all, all of the collaboration features within the Office desktop apps for any file that's synced. So really, let's say I'm signed into my OneDrive with my sync client. Any file that I'm collaborating on or working on in my OneDrive or in any team site I'm syncing, this is really what powers autosave, sharing that file, being able to co-author. And so turning that off, basically, we don't recommend that at all. And you should make sure that you have that enabled. Uh, this is one of the ones that's also truly magic. Like, no one else in the world has an yeah. experience where you can take files offline but still get the full power of the cloud exactly. when you work with them. Yeah. Um, and as we add new features and capabilities, yeah. they're all lighting up. Right. It's really yeah. cool. Without any plugins or anything. You that's, yeah. that's exactly Go right. Directly yeah, exactly. Um, and then the last one I'll mention is really files on demand. I mentioned earlier... This one can really, really help with that network bandwidth um, scenario, especially if you've done a, a migration to the cloud and want to avoid all of those documents just automatically syncing. Or if the user is syncing a team site, for example, that might have a lot of changes going on, and they don't actually need access to all those files. But basically, files on demand, in case you're not familiar, you can access all of your files from your file explorer or uh, from Finder on Mac uh, without actually having those all on your device. And so... Only if you actually open a file or if you explicitly mark it as always available offline, then we will actually download it. That has really a lot of really great outcomes for the user. The first one is really faster initial sync. And so that's both in the case of, I mentioned, a migration, but also particularly in virtualized desktop environments where the user logs in. We don't have to wait for all of those files to download on every new session Saves disk space, of course, so especially on machines that have less disk space and with a lot of files, for example, in a team site, that's really helpful. And then I mentioned network utilization. And that goes hand in hand with this one, I'll give you one more, is the storage sense policies. Um, they're really a way for admins um, to configure when to clean up files that have been downloaded to the machine. And so those were something that shipped in Windows 10 1903. And it's something I definitely recommend taking a look at if users are... Uh, using files on demand. So storage sense will help us automatically clear files that exactly, we have not used, yeah, exactly. right? Exactly, and there's a bunch of different configurations, yeah. So that's cool. 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 And Gaia briefly mentioned uh, Sync Ideal State, which I think we discussed in our last podcast as well, as to the different deployment best practices that can drive good user engagement. Mm -hmm. Um, so I know we've done a webinar before, and I would also uh, recommend the listeners to check out our deployment webinar on ak.ms slash OneDrive webinar, in which you spoke more about the uh, Sync Ideal State and how they are based on us working with big organizations and also working with our internal IT team. Mm -hmm. um, Oh, and I'm assuming all these GPOs constitute two uh, the same ideas. Yeah, state. these are all of the main GPOs that we have called out. There. Do you want yeah. to talk about anything else related to sync ideal state or have? Yeah, so we the the other part is the updates and making sure we talked about that already. Making sure auto updates work and then uh, encouraging folks to stay on production and then have some users in setter. So we talked about that one. And the only last one is really about making sure. To Drew's point earlier, you have all of those URLs unblocked and really that are documented in the Office 365 URL page. Um, and that's super important. In particular, there's a scenario, there's a mechanism we use called Windows Notification Service that we use basically for the client to know about any change that's happening in the cloud. So let's say I'm working um, you know, on my mobile device, and then I make a change that gets uploaded to the service, and then we have to download that on the sync client. WNS is what allows us to get notified that that happens silently so that we don't have to constantly ask the service every yeah. few minutes. And so making sure WNS is configured correctly is also critical. And yeah. I think a good reference there is the Ignite talk we gave about deployment and Correct. adoption. Correct. Um, so we can include that as well. As yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. Okay, so Guy, those, those are your top items. But Drew, did you have any others to add? I did. I mean, so she had four. So <laughs> I get, I'll, I'm just going to do two then. <laughs> so we even had a three, three and three. So I, I really like what I uh, talked about from KFM and Files on Amanda. So I want to make sure that those are, if I had to pick two, or those would be mine. You need to make sure you figure out how you get people on the KFM, and you need to make sure you're having people uh, working with Files on Demand. Uh, when Files on Demand came out, I, I remember talking with customers. I mean, this is one that actually changed the way people worked. 
and it's incredibly powerful and knowing how it works and now with the addition of storage sense you're starting to see the full integration between OneDrive and Windows desktop together to kind of see that Microsoft 365 picture um, so yeah you got those two um, and the other two but uh, two I like to mention uh, a little bit more around uh, security and controls, which we do see, uh, again, more at uh, larger companies. So uh, one specifically around preventing syncing of personal OneDrive accounts. Uh, a lot of organizations, we want to make sure we have those controls. Uh, if you if you have not gone down the full data protection route yet uh, to ensure that your files are staying in locations that you want to have secured, uh, you are most likely securing your environment through network. So you're going to say, I don't want you to go into your Gmail account or your personal Outlook account right now or your personal OneDrive account to, to move files out um, potentially maliciously or even accidentally. So there is a capability through GPO to uh, disable personal uh, disable sync of a personal OneDrive account on a specific workstation. So you can kind of control your data. Um, the next one around control, I'd say, is around only allowing, uh, allowing sync only for specific domains or organizations. So ensuring that when you do have sync deployed and you do have it sync enabled and if you look at trying to become more more cloud-friendly and Azure AD hosted, uh, you can't guarantee where these people are always going to be. You can't guarantee what network they're always going to be on. You could start to put controls around it, but if let's say we want to manage our device and the files on it, we can actually control uh, which domains or organizations or tenants are actually being synced back down onto your company workstation. So a lot of power there. Uh, I think a giant takeaway is just know all of the GPO policies that are there. There are a lot. Uh, and the administrative templates that uh, that guy mentioned before, those are also incredibly powerful. Look at how those work together to really fit your, your needs for your company. The last one that you mentioned, Drew, can be done from the admin center as well, right? A, a great question for kind of breaking apart for how you can do those controls. So if you make a, for a blocking sync. So if you want to block sync for specific organizations, you can absolutely do that from uh, the tenants or from the OneDrive admin center. Uh, if you do it through group policy, that will actually take it down to your device. So it depends on your exact environment, but you may have a scenario where uh, you could be running multiple tenants in your environment and multiple workstations, and um, and you can kind of mix and match those. So it depends on where you actually need the block to occur, because the GPO happens on your workstation, and the admin center will block everything. Right? It'll block anyone else kind of coming back in. So it's really good to understand, that's a good point, that there are both locations that you can control that. Great points, both of you. And finally, the goal is to move closer to a modern desktop experience for all. Um, and again, listeners, th this was a lot of information. Please uh, look at ak.ms slash OneDrive slash deployment. You can get more than enough information on all the GPOs and uh, other settings that was mentioned by both uh, Drew and Gaia. I wanted to ask a fun question, and could, can I do that? Yes. To both Drew and Gaia, For I'm sure. curious, and I suspect our listeners will be curious as well, uh, which is, you know, kind of just to hear about, like, what's some of the the bigger messes that you've actually seen with maybe a deployment gone wrong or a setup gone wrong that you've had to help someone work their way out of. Drew, let's start with you. Well, yeah, this is I'll, fun I'll for some, fun specifically <laughs> not for few. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so in working with different companies and different organizations, so whether you're in manufacturing or healthcare or, or government, it, you see people using OneDrive in all the different ways that you can even imagine. And we... I get a lot of questions always about, like, well, can I just move my files up there? I have a big network share, and I just want to move my content. I'm like, well, that's not really the goal. But so I had a company uh, that was a, uh, it was a ma I think it was a manufacturing company, and their sales team uh, came to me and said, "Hey, Drew, uh, I need to move all of my files, or I need to get rid of my data off my servers. Basically, I need to free this up. So I'm going to move it to OneDrive." And I said, "I mean, okay. I didn't really have much context around it, but uh, what they ended up doing." is they moved all of their sales content into the manager's OneDrive. Uh, all of their, all of their uh, materials, all of the brochures, uh, their marketing materials that they would use for selling. And I think it was close to 500 plus users were impacted because wow. what happened was he, he, took, he built his own little folder structure in OneDrive, uh, shared it with uh, all, of his, all of the individuals, and then uh, actually use screenshots of the shared with me folder or shared by me folder, basically, and told people that this is how they should be accessing their content. And then uh, that manager actually was no longer with the company, which then 
triggered the lifecycle process to oh no to remove the files. Uh, and so after 30 days, by default, files will be removed, and salespeople all of a sudden lost access to all of their files because it was OneDrive was basically just kind of set up, not necessarily technically wrong, but just in a way that it didn't necessarily make sense. Right? That's not that wasn't necessarily the goal of OneDrive. So right. they shared a lot of files, built materials that weren't shouldn't be built, and they lost a lot of content for a, a decent amount of time. Um, that was a that was an interesting one to kind of come back into afterwards and, and hear that one. Oh, hear that that's, story. that's a tough one. That's a tough one. Do you know if they were able to like recover it from the administrative recycle bin? And they ended up going mainly with uh, so they didn't. Uh, they mainly got them from all of the uh, salespeople actually stopped using it <laughs> in that direction, <laughs> and they ended up putting them mainly into their own OneDrive. So it just took a took more of a more time to kind of bring them back into a different location and back into SharePoint and in overall Office 365 and a shared location in general. But so it was definitely a, a smaller process afterwards. It was a first, the urgency was, oh my God, what happened? Right. <laughs> and then it's kind of go, wait, we're actually okay because we didn't use it that much. <laughs> Oof. Okay. That's a tough one. Guy, what do you got? Okay. I'll talk about one that I alluded to earlier when we were talking about network bandwidth utilization. Um, so I worked with a company, I think last year. It's a big company, multinational, has a lot of different um, um, kind of satellite offices all over the world. And some of them have, you know, uh, network infrastructure that uh, has less bandwidth. And so we kind of got involved with them because they had done a migration and then people started using sync and they were seeing just certain offices just get over, their network get overwhelmed by sync traffic. Um, and so we started digging into data and figuring out, okay, what's going on here? Um, and some of the biggest things we found, one, they had a bunch of users syncing really big PST files. And of course, Outlook was continuously changing those. And so those were frequently changing files. And then they were causing a lot of upload bandwidth. Um, they ended up blocking PST files from the admin center um, to kind of get around that one. And that helped a bunch in the upload traffic. They also had a lot of uh, cases of machines that had files on demand off. And so in particular for team sites where there were a lot of changes happening, they were just seeing the fan out of all of the people syncing those team sites, just getting so much uh, bandwidth utilized for changes they might not even need because they weren't right. editing those files. 100 people syncing a team site, one yeah, person changes exactly. the file, we all get it. Yeah, and so we that was clear from the data because we were just seeing so many downloads from team sites. Um, and so we worked with them to make sure they enabled files on demand. They had some folks still on Windows 7. Um, and so they were kind of accelerating the deployment to Windows 10. And so that really helped. And then they also temporarily took advantage of some of our bandwidth um, group policies to try to mitigate the impact temporarily. Um, now, of course, we don't necessarily recommend leaving those on just because they can impact the user experience, but they can be something to take a look at. Um, okay. And Woo. so that was one that was kind of gnarly to get out of, but um, we learned a How lot for sure. Plan. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Why planning is important. Yep. And I really like the guy that you mentioned, uh, the network bandwidth ones, because those are really good to put on initially while you're doing a rollout, and then make sure you pull them out so you can kind of control some of that network impact. But mm -hmm. that's a, yeah, once you lose network, it's it's hard. To, a lot of people point fingers. That's what yeah, I see. Yeah, exactly. It's, you don't know what's happening, and then you start running reports, and people can't get the internet, and a lot of Who's watching their Netflix? Happening. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. That, yes. Yeah. There are settings for people to uh, block uh, syncing or upload of PST files, right? Yeah, so you can do that from the admin center. Um, we are also in the process of rolling out a few changes that will reduce the frequency of us uploading PST changes because that's just a very common scenario we're seeing. Yeah. Um, but th there's other cases, not just of PST files, but other files that frequently change. One that we see, we've started seeing a bunch, especially with KFM, is uh, if people have uh, code repositories that are in the documents folder, and those are changing a bunch, that can lead to issues. So there's a bunch of scenarios, but PSDs are definitely the one that yeah. we hear about the most. So what are your top one or two learnings uh, from a successful deployment that you've had that every customer who is listening to us right now should note? So I'd like to, I always start with what are your goals, right? So what are what do you really want to accomplish to, to have a successful deployment? Is it, do you want to migrate or do we want to not? I mean, those are two really big questions that you need to answer. And then understanding what the GPO policies that we've been talking about for a lot of this, how you want to control them. And do you need to control them? 
a good practice I like doing is is actually have a, a big Excel file with all of the different GPO policies and configurations available to them. And I'll work with and we'll walk through each of them and talk about how they can relate to each other and are they needed or aren't they needed? And then ensuring you kind of test and plan through that. So understanding where you want to go uh, and then part of that, make sure you have that adoption, plan, like that adoption plan, and then really figuring out those GPO controls that you're going to work with or admin templates you're going to work with to uh, to manage that deployment. Very cool. Guy, what about you? Yeah. Um, so first, I'll go back to the sync ideal state. Um, that's a set of six best practices that really provide the best sync experience to all your users and to admin admins managing them. And we've kind of evolved them based on both working within Microsoft and with a lot of different companies of different skills. And we, so we really recommend taking a look at those. Um, we'll have the link, some links in the show notes. But those are really, we have a lot of group policies, but those in particular are really important to get familiar with and to think through how you're going to um, get there in, within the organization. Uh, the second one is really around KFM guidance. And some of the things we've seen based on working with a lot of customers who have deployed the known folder move um, in the past year since we've released it. So there's two main scenarios to think about. One is for new devices. That can be a new employee joining the company or someone getting a new machine, for example. Always a happy day. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so there we definitely recommend, you know, enable KFM from the start because there's no files there generally. Um, and so it's there's not there's no really concerns around a huge spike in upload bandwidth. And so Start off with KFM so that all the files that get created go immediately into OneDrive and you don't run into any issues moving them or just really high bandwidth utilization later. Um, the, the one that we definitely recommend planning is the existing devices because especially if an employee like me has been at a company for seven years, I have a lot of data in my documents folder. I can have maybe gigs or gigs of data. And so really planning that out and doing that gradually in batches is super important. And especially, there's two main group policies for a known folder move. Uh, one that prompts the user. And there, you know, you'll prompt the user and then you'll see a click-through rate of a certain X percentage. But really, the silent one is the one that does it for everyone. And so that's really important to you. We've seen, based on, for example, what we did within Microsoft, not go over 500 or a little bit more devices per day, just because there's so many users that have so much data in their documents folder. Um, so definitely plan that one out, and don't deploy to batches that are too large all at once. Awesome. Yeah, don't underestimate KFM. I yeah, think that's a exactly. really, really good point. <laughs> it's, it's super powerful, but you really don't, uh, when you scale it out, it takes time. Yeah. And Especially if you have existing redirection policies in place to do like a redirection, you, your F drive or a P drive, make sure you understand how that's going to work because they don't work together. And you need to make sure that plan is tested, uh, piloted, and what that cutover really looks like, including everything that Guy just mentioned. So there's a lot kind of around that. One thing I really like to mention here as well is that there, when you're planning it, uh, there actually is a script available for you to help monitor and manage that actually from, uh, from Microsoft here to talk about what uh, you can actually run this PowerShell during your deployment to see what is is this device eligible for KFM, what's the status of this device, and actually see what GPOs have been set on that device. Yeah. Um, so yeah, as you totally. scale it out, it's a really helpful script to manage uh, to manage your deployment of KFM to, yeah, to a lot. Yeah, totally. And that's, that's one that we already have. It's published in GitHub. Um, another thing we demoed an early preview at, at during Ignite, um, which I know is something that's super top of mind for a lot of folks deploying OneDrive Sync is um, more insight into kind of the health of Sync, what issues are there, the status, whether or not KFM is done. And so that's something we showed a very early preview of, something we definitely know a lot of you need. And so we're working on that and stay tuned for more later this year. Looking forward to that one. That's, that's exciting. exciting. Yeah. yeah. All right, we are nearing the end of our time, but we do have our kind of fun last question to ask. And this month, it's what's the last emoji you used? So pull out your phones, Ooh, okay. check real oh quick, think hard, and, uh, <laughs> and tell us what it is. I'll kick it off, though. Uh, the last one I used was the unicorn emoji, which it turns out I use a lot. Nice. So, <laughs> That's not even on my frequently used. That's, I'm going to have yeah. to step my you game up here. You use a unicorn emoji? <laughs> So, yeah. 
as I've just demonstrated in the booth, <laughs> I showed Ankita the unicorn emoji. Yes. And so the unicorn emoji is it's one of my favorites. It's a great one. I use face palm and eye roll a lot. But, but those are not my favorite emoji. What was the last one you used? Face palm. Face palm. All right, Drew, what was the last one you used? I use I usually use shrug. So if you had to go favorite, I use shrug a lot. Uh, but I've been my last one was a wave. A wave. Okay, that's very friendly. Mm-hmm. All right, Gaia, take us home. Yeah, uh, it looks like the last one I use is the red heart. Aww. <laughs> the one, the other one I use a lot okay, is I the... I want to change my answer because You can't I, change your answer. I seem like the rudest person over here. I, the, no. <laughs> Let me go to another person whom I spoke last and I use the hug emoji, C. Okay. I All congratulate right. you. We're changing <laughs> Ankita's answer to hug. Yeah. And Gaia had the red heart. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Drew and Guy. If people want to find out and learn more about you, reach out to you, where should they do that? Yeah, great question. You can find me on Twitter. My Twitter handle is Karini G, so my last name and my first initial. Or you can find me also on LinkedIn. And Drew? Uh, yeah, and actually, so I can be reached either mainly on Twitter at, uh, at DMadelung. Also, I have a blog at DrewMadelung.com. Uh, and I'm a frequent speaker kind of across the country. So I'll be uh, at a couple conferences coming up, including uh, talking about some, some OneDrive, at, some OneDrive co- topics at the SharePoint conference coming up in May. Ooh, I can't wait. It's going to be a fun time. Bye. Thank you both again for being on Sync Up. Yeah, thanks so much for having us. This was super fun. It was actually my first podcast. So Awesome. <laughs> Yay, it was fun. Yep. And thank you so much <laughs> for thanks. calling in, Drew. Yeah, this was great. This was great to, to hear and, and, and share some share some information out there today. I yeah. hope your fans on Twitter are happy with us now. That's, I'm sure they'll wish for more airtime, but that's okay. We'll find ways to get Drew back on stage. All right, next up, we've got our roadmap updates and important upcoming events. So don't go away. It's time to share with the listeners the latest news and announcements, including feature releases and upcoming events. Now, last month, we had uh, a lot of great functionalities that were rolled out, and most of them were by Gaia's team. Uh, The first one that I've been waiting for a very long time is enabling migrations of local OneNote notebooks to OneDrive via PC folder backup, or as we used to call it, known folder move. The next two uh, we spoke about in our last podcast as well, uh, which were conditional access for Mac OS uh, and single sign-on with Office for Mac OS. So now OneDrive for Mac uh, respects conditional access policies such as forced uh, multi-factor authentication, location-based IP range filtering, and device compliance. And also, the OneDrive Sync client now shares credentials between the rest of the Office suite on macOS. So currently, both these features are in preview and soon to be generally available. Now, we have a great integration between Outlook and uh, OneDrive. And to make this integration even better, we have released few updates. With this update, you will be able to save time and collaborate faster with comment and context previews in the at mention and comment emails. So this implies that when using Outlook, you'll be able to reply to the comments without even needing to leave Outlook. That's amazing, right? You could say right instead of nodding. People can't hear your nod, Jason. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, finally, standardizing email templates to reflect consistency across products, uh, along with adding file previewer thumbnails and activity details in our email notifications. Oh, and we have one more. We now have default to people with existing access on a per site basis. So prior to this change, SharePoint administrators could only choose anyone, people in my organization or specific people when setting the default sharing link on a per site basis. Now we've also added people with existing access as a new default option. So now when you share or copy a link, you will receive an existing link access uh, that does not change the permission on the item. Jason, what are the next events that are coming up? We have a great set of events coming up. First up is Ignite the Tour. It continues to travel the globe, offering you wherever you are the advantages of Microsoft's annual immersive Ignite conference, including workshops, sessions, trainings, learning paths, keynotes, and more. 
Each tour event specializes in highlighting the technology, issues, and people of the area. In February, that includes Sydney, Taipei, Singapore, Prague, and Copenhagen. And in March, we have Shanghai, Hong Kong, Zurich, Amsterdam, Madrid, and Mexico City. To find the city nearest you, check out the link in our show notes, and you can follow hashtag MSIgniteTheTour and visit Microsoft.com slash IgniteTheTour. And you're going to Singapore, and I'm going to Madrid. I'll be in Singapore. You'll be in Madrid. It's going to be awesome. Those are going to be, I hear those are going to be some of the best stops on the Ignite the Tour because we're there. Obviously. And be sure to check out the new podcast following Ignite the Tour called The Uptake. In each episode, Microsoft's own Anna Chu talks with tour city locals in the tech community, Ignite speakers, and others about current issues in tech, personal career journeys, professional learning, how-tos, and more. This week's episode highlights this week's tour in Sydney, Australia. Look for The Uptake with Anna Chu on techcommunity.microsoft.com or wherever you get your podcasts. Of course, May 19th, we have SharePoint Conference kicking off in Las Vegas. It's an absolutely massive deal. We love being there. A whole lot of new announcements, cool features and capabilities there across talks, workshops, uh, all sorts of training, and some really killer keynotes. So hoping to see you there as well. So, Jason, I really look forward to this portion of the show each month because you always surprise me with the topic of discussion. What's on your mind this month? Well, I thought this month we might talk about the concept of being attentive, being present uh, with others, and specifically about a tool our team uses for that. We have a lot of meetings, of course, as you know. You and I have a lot of meetings together as we do our jobs. And I bet a lot of the time, you know, for those of you listening, you feel the same. There's a lot of meetings you've got and things you've got to do. And one of the challenges we often have is how to make the most of our meetings. They're expensive. You know, all those people that are in that meeting not doing other parts of the job. And things that make it worse is when we're not present, you know, when someone's not getting the full attention applied to the meeting. Like when you're using a phone or checking emails on a laptop and I'm talking to you. That's that's exactly right. Well, we've all felt the pull, you know, the notion that somewhere in the back of our brain we know the inbox is filling up uh, as we're sitting in that meeting, that there's work that's not getting done and you're going to have to do it later and it's just there, it's on your desk where you're not at. It's a natural feeling, it's a natural struggle, we all have it. And so it makes it hard to be fully present, to really kind of root our attention in the here and now and have the best meeting possible, to apply yourself fully to it. And there's a lot that goes into that. But one challenge we wanted to tackle is how we could give our team a consistent way to talk about their expectations and to set that with other members of the team. And so we created this hashtag we call No Screens. Yes, I get so many meeting invites with this hashtag, and it's it's really cool. So as I understand it, you ask folks not to bring out their phones or laptops. So basically, not open their laptops is better yet to not get them to the office or to the meeting rooms. That, that's exactly right. It's, the idea is to remove a distraction. And interestingly, um, a number of studies show that this, this distraction affects others. If you see someone with their on their phone or on their laptop, it causes you to get distracted and no longer pay attention to things getting on. So there's a group effect out of it. And so the idea was that we would have that actually show up as a a way for people to signal that they wanted people to be really present in that meeting and also give them permission. If they couldn't meet that, they needed to be on the phone, they needed to be on their laptop for some reason, it's okay. Don't come to that meeting because that meeting isn't about that. Yeah, I think you can prioritize if that meeting is, I mean, you need to be there. Um, Else, if you are there, then give the due respect to the people who are, who have done the due diligence and presenting stuff at the meeting. So I have had this question in my mind. Why the hashtag? It's a great question. There's a two part to this one. Part one is the branding thing. It was just a handy way to talk about it, you know, to put the hashtag kind of together. It seemed kind of cool. Uh, but part two is a little bit more important. It, it really is about giving the team permission to put it in meeting subjects as a way to signal to everyone that had that expectation, uh, that the meeting had that expectation, and that had the full support of our leadership. Uh, Jeff Teeper uses these for meetings, and Jeff expects us all to follow it as well. And so that is a really powerful thing as a way to know that our entire organization supports it, and everyone has a common language for it. So even the most junior person on the team, for example, who's organizing a meeting, gets to set expectations for their meeting and how we should act in it. 
So I have been to those meetings and I love how the team stays so much in the moment. Everyone is present. Everyone is attentive. But what if someone really has a pressing matter and needs to take that one glance at their phone? Right. And, and you know, we've all been there and there are real cases for that. Uh, maybe uh, there's something going on in your personal life. Uh, you know, I've uh, gotten interrupted when I've had a kid at school that the school's called me. Um, that's okay. You know, the, we're all adults. It, the, the point isn't to try to prevent people from having their lives or have, deal with those other uh, important work things. But really say, look, if you're expecting that, if that's something you have to do, it's okay not to attend the meeting. You can follow up with the notes. You can catch up uh, later from those things. Focus on the thing that clearly is a priority and a challenge for you. And it's also okay to say when you recognize that to step out of that moment yeah. and to say, okay, I, I need to be doing something else. What's really interesting is that over time, as we've gotten used to doing it and the team has gotten really comfortable with it. Uh, it's actually resulted in a couple of interesting things. One is we have much more productive and satisfying meetings, and people note this. Um, they talk about it. We just had a thread the other day uh, amongst the leadership talking about how people have noticed this in surveys. Um, but it also leads to shorter meetings. And I, I almost don't know if there's a meeting that wouldn't have been more awesome if it was just a little bit shorter. And so that's something we think has really generated value for people, not just, hey, everyone's paying attention to this, but I'm getting more out of it. I'm getting through things faster, we're focused on problems, and we're beating them down better. Um, but that being fully immersed and being efficient is really powerful. That's cool. So guys, you've heard, Jason, it's time to no screens your meeting as well and be attentive. So thank you to our guests, Gaia Karini and Dew Madling. To learn more about OneDrive and the latest developments, please follow our tech community blog at ak.ms slash OneDrive slash blog. Please do send us your questions and feedback. You can reach us on Twitter at, at OneDrive, at Jasmo, and at Ankita underscore Kirti21. And definitely visit our show page for links, resources, and more at aka.ms slash Syncup. That's S-Y-N-C-U-P. Subscribe to and follow the show wherever you get your podcasts. Did you know that the most successful way people discover new podcasts is by word of mouth? So if you enjoy Syncup, spread the word. Tell your colleagues, friends, parents, kids, teachers, running partner, help others learn about and find the show. We all know how important and impactful sharing can be. And if you're interested in hearing other cool shows by Microsoft, go to ak.ms slash Microsoft slash podcast. There's something for everyone. Thank you for listening to Sync Up, a show about OneDrive, the intelligent files app for Microsoft 365. We are your hosts, Ankita Kirti and Jason Moore. We'll catch up with you next month. Bye.